like to introduce uh, Jesse Powell, uh, who is going to give the um, the keynote uh, this morning, the, the first keynote. And um, Hyperloop does not exist in a vacuum. That's the, the title. There is a subtitle, the challenges and opportunities of putting uh, MacLab in a chip. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Great. <laughs> I changed the title a little bit. Um, Lessons learned from maglev history is the subtitle. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to the organizing committee. You guys have put on a great um, uh, conference, and I've learned a lot. Uh, I'm uh, coming from an outsider uh, uh, position in the maglev world, and I haven't really interact interacted with the Hyperloop world much. Uh, so this has been a great learning experience for me, and, and the enthusiasm I see here was was um, fantastic. Um, so <laughs> uh, a little background. Um, my father is James Powell, who, along with Gordon Danby, both from Brookhaven National Lab, uh, were the original inventors of superconducting maglev. Um, uh, their paper back in uh, the early 60s and their patent in 1966 um, really laid the foundations for superconducting maglev in terms of um, electrodynamics and suspension, null flux loop um, uh, geometries for minimizing, minimizing inductive losses in guideways, uh, the linear synchronous motor, putting that all together in a package where current carrying loops of su superconductor on the vehicle acted as magnets, created um, what is now today superconducting maglev. And so this is over 50 years ago. Um, there's a lot of history here. Um, uh, <coughs> So um, coming from this multi-decade history uh, in 2013, when the white paper came out from Elon Musk about Hyperloop Alpha, um, we kind of stepped back and scratched our heads a little bit. And we were like, what, what, is, what is going on here? I mean, why are there air bearings? Um, what's this compressor nonsense? Um, uh, it seemed like it had s several serious engineering challenges that we weren't sure it could be overcome. And at the time, I, I joked, well, it's air hockey in a tube. Um, and pretty soon, they're going to switch to maglev in a tube. And then they might just get rid of the tube. And then we'll be back to maglev. Um, and so I was pretty skeptical, I have to admit, in the beginning. And, um, but my position has evolved, as has Hyperloop. Today, we're seeing something much closer to maglev uh, as uh, in, in the atmosphere, we have uh, um, magnetic levitation and propulsion, uh, electrodynamic stable uh, suspension, uh, linear synchronous motors. It's very hard to actually know what is going on with the companies because they're not very um, forthcoming in the details. But um, it's evolving towards more and more of a traditional maglev approach. Um, uh, and I, uh, I think. Putting maglev in a tube and running at low pressures is is something that we should shoot for. So I think uh, we're we're getting there. Of course, it's not a new idea. Um, Hyperloop didn't spring from Elon Musk's head like some sort of Greek god. Um, it goes back to 1799. Atmospheric railways, uh, George Methurst, all throughout the 1800s, um, there were. Uh, you know, prototypes built. There are actual passenger carrying lines in New York City and in London. Um, these lines had several problems. Of course, keeping low pressure in tubes back then, using leather as your vacuum seals uh, is problematic. Um, uh, but there was a lot of similarities. There was, there was a plan to go from London to Edinburgh um, with an atmospheric railway. Um, uh, stock uh, was <coughs> floated. Um, there was a lot of excitement. Um, uh, uh, Jules Verne, the author of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, said, well, why don't we build one across the Atlantic Ocean and go 1,800 kilometers an hour? So <clears throat> these are, uh, um, even back then, people were, were thinking really um, big. Uh, move forward to the 1900s, 1904, 1906, the father of American rocketry, uh, Goddard, uh, Robert Goddard, was um, uh, the first to really use electric propulsion and levitation and put it in a pod in a vacuum tube. 
Um, this eventually got patented in the 1950s, I believe, by his wife soon after his death. He was looking at a northeast corridor with a hyperloop type design. All through the 70s and 80s, of course, we have Swiss Metro. Um, um, in the United States, we had the Rand Corporation, Bob Salter. Uh, my father was also talking about Mach 3 maglev. maglev. Um, they were talking once again about transoceanic systems. Uh, the people who built the channel were interested in making a vac train across the Atlantic. Today, the Chinese are very interested about putting maglev in tubes, um, in low pressure tubes. And they're talking about uh, a couple thousand kilometers per hour. Um, and then the ultimate ex extension of this idea, of course, is uh, accelerating these pods to orbital velocity and then shooting things out into space. Um, there's various um, versions of this. This is all electromagnetic launch. Um, uh, Dad's uh, version of this, uh, uh, Star Tram, he, he published 20 years ago. So there's a lot of history here. Um, and the question is, why hasn't Hyperloop been, been done before? <coughs> it's, uh, it's not because there was no Elon Musk before, but it's because Hyperloop sits at the intersection of four very hard requirements. You have to combine a medium vacuum, uh, 0.1 millibar or so thereabouts, um, in a large system that's hundreds of kilometers long, uh, millions of cubic meters, um, uh, large swings in temperature, many points of failure. You have to have something that goes fast, and it's no problem going fast. We can all go fast in a straight line. Going fast around curves is the problem. Um, so you have to have straight alignments, which in today's society and, and built up cities is hard to achieve. Um, above all, the system has to be safe. Um, it has to be robust to terrorist attack or, or just crazy people. Um, um, you have to have emergency exit procedures all along this tube. You can't just get out at the end at San Francisco. Um, uh, you have to have a way of building this that has all these very stringent um, design requirements uh, affordably. Um, if you're going 1,000 kilometers an hour, you have to build your guide weight to very tight tolerances. Um, it has to be able to have redundant safety systems. And, um, and if you want to run it in California, it has to be safe for uh, seismic uh, conditions. Add into this um, hard problem uh, a culture of nimbyism in this country, anyhow, and government bureaucracy. And it's not surprising that Hyperloop hasn't been built yet, or Maglev, for that matter. Um, a matter of fact, I ultimately I think we're going to see uh, Hyperloop built in in uh, places like uh, Dubai and other places first, and not in the United States. <coughs> so, what are the lessons from Maglev? So, Maglev has 50 plus years of research, development, uh, testing, and evaluation. Um, most notably, uh, Japan Rail's effort, which has been phenomenal. Um, uh, we have working systems around the world that we can draw lessons from, um, not just in Japan, but now in China. Um, and Maglev faces a lot of the same uh, design space as Hyperloop, just minus the vacuum part. So in a nutshell, <coughs> the four major lessons that uh, we have to bring into Hyperloop are a larger levitation gap is better when you're traveling at high speeds. Uh, straight alignments are absolutely required, and I'll go into more detail about these. Um, Passenger-only systems are rarely profitable. If you look at around the world, passenger-only systems are money-losing propositions. They all require high government subsidies. I don't think there's any reason to think Hyperloop will be any different. Um, uh, maximizing throughput, if you have a fixed infrastructure, whether it's maglev or steel wheel or Hyperloop, you have to maximize your throughput to make as much money as possible. There's ways to do that, but Hyperloop is not currently um, a, a addressing that. So I'm going to take a little sidetrack. Um, so Dad and Gordon Danby's um, uh, original first generation designs were really people focused, passenger uh, focused. 
back in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a brief window where the federal government was like, okay, let's build a maglev. Um, and this is the second time it's happened. It's kind of like Lucy in the football. They, they put it out there and then they take it away. Um, anyhow, during that time, uh, they formed a company called Maglev 2000 and they rethought uh, what maglev could be and should be, especially in the United States. Um, so they realized to make money at maglev, you have to transport freight. Um, so they redesigned their magnet system geometry um, and uh, uh, had heavier lifts, and they were, they were looking at roll-on, roll-off trucking specifically. So you roll on a truck in California, eight hours Later, you roll it off in New York, and you get your um, produce to market that much faster. Trucking in the United States is a $800 billion business, compared to passengers, including all the airlines, is $100 billion. So the market is much bigger in freight than in passengers. Their design uh, changes also included the ability to run the same vehicle on narrow beam guideways um, at high speed between cities, and then also flat planar guideways that you could put on the ground, say, for example, flanking existing rail, rail lines, so you could reuse right-of-ways uh, and go into dense uh, urban cores. Um, there's a couple other advantages that I'll go into, but the, that flat panel um, capability is, is crucial. So the key features, again, heavy freight, multiple guideways. Um, they designed their guideways to be prefab, um, made in, in factories ahead of time, and then shipped to the site and bolted in place. This uh, <laughs> lowers the cost dramatically st compared to custom construction and makes the deployment that much quicker. Also, you want to be able to run your vehicles in single vehicle mode or multi-vehicle mode depending on your demand. Um, if you have the flexibility to uh, switch um, pretty quickly between single and multi-vehicle mode, that gives you a lot more flexibility and cost efficiency. Most importantly, especially from the point of the Hyperloop, they had a high-speed switch. No other maglev system has a high-speed switch, um, and no Hyperloop system that I've seen has a high-speed switch. If you have a planar guideway, you can have two guideways that slowly diverge. They're kind of overlapping in the beginning, and they slowly, slowly diverge. And depending on which loops are connected or not, it pulls the maglev vehicle to one side or the other. This means you can switch at high speed, which means you can maintain the throughput of your network um, uh, uh, at high levels. And then finally, each maglev vehicle is basically uh, autonomous from the get-go. There's no conductor. There's no people telling it where to go. Um, it's the guideway itself through uh, adjusting the AC frequency in the, in the guideway that accelerates and decelerates the vehicle. So if you have a nationwide network with thousands or tens of thousands of vehicles, these are all being controlled by central computer control algorithms. And ultimately, um, this is going to be an interesting AI problem, where you're dispatching resources where they're needed on the fly all the time. And it's, um, uh, what it leads to is a much more efficient use of your infrastructure. So they didn't just think up a new idea and write it down. Uh, during that brief window, um, they were able to take $5 million and build a bunch of prototypes. They bu built the quadrupole magnets. Um, they built panels, uh, guideway components. They built beams, a chassis, and an aer aero shell. But there's really not a lot you can do for $5 million. Um, you can't build a long guideway. You can't put the whole system together. They were able to test the components at the, at the component level, but more work needs to be done. So going back to the lessons learned for Hyperloop is, first one, large levitation gaps are crucial. Um, if you're traveling 1,000 or 1,200 kilometers an hour um, and there is some sort of uh, displacement because a truck hits a, pie, a pier or something like that and you have a one centimeter displacement and you only have a one centimeter levitation gap, you're going to have a bad day. If you have a uh, 10 centimeter gap, you have a much more capability to overcome those problems. More, more uh, common, and this, I think you'll see this uh, commonly due to earth settling or uh, not quite um, uh, working, you know, level, leveling on the, uh, on the tube and the pilings. Um, you're going to have gradual displacements over hundreds of meters or something like that. But still, going that fast, that is a serious problem if you have a small levitation gap. 
the levitation options are transrapid, the German system, electromagnetic active suspension. Again, very tiny levitation gap, very high guideway tolerances. This is the real reason the transrapid trans system failed. It was just too expensive to build their guideways. Um, the, te the, the ride was perfect. Uh, in duct track, which seems to be the technology of choice for, for Hyperloop, where you have haulback arrays of permanent magnets, uh, you're doubling the field with haulback arrays. You get, can get a somewhat higher um, levitation gap for a given weight uh, load. Um, but still not quite as high as I would like to see. Um, the Japanese superconducting maglev has a 10 centimeter gap. You can uh, increase the field to even higher if you want to, depending on how much current you put through those current carrying loops or how much superconductor you have. And then, uh, so the guideway tolerances for that can be uh, much lower than for, say, um, transrapid. And then finally, who knows what the Chinese are doing, but they're doing some very interesting things uh, that I've seen in the periphery. There's a lot of interest in what are called trap field superconductors, where you can essentially make a permanent magnet out of a solid crystal of, of superconductor uh, by exposing it to a high field. Then you take the high field away, and then all of a sudden this is a permanent magnet. If you keep it at liquid uh, nitrogen temperatures, it has 10 times the field strength of, <laughs> of a permanent magnet. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, a lot of interesting things are happening in the maglev world in terms of levitation. Another aspect of going fast um, is you have longer stopping times. Uh, if you're going at full speed, it's going to take you 30 seconds at 1G to slow down. Um, and 1G is a lot. Uh, that means you basically have to be in your pod in a five-point harness all the time to, if you're worried about um, any sort of emergency. Um, even one minute is half a G. That's stronger than you ever experience on a, a really hard landing on an airplane. Um, uh, two minutes, 0.25 Gs, still too much. Really, 0.2 Gs is what you want to shoot for so that people don't have to have a seatbelt on all the time. Um, so that's three minutes of stopping, of headway between the pods. When you're only carrying 26 people or 40 people per pod, that means your throughput is not going to be very high. Radius of curvature, if you double the speed you have to maintain the same lateral acceleration, you have to increase your radius of curvature by a factor of four. So maglev, to get that 0.2 g lateral acceleration comfort limit, um, has a radius of curvature of 10 kilometers. Hyperloop is going to require 40 kilometers it's really hard to find alignments through populated countries where you have those straight alignments, uh, which means you have to slow down your pod, which means your throughput goes down, and what's the point of having a slow hyperloop? Um, also, if you're terrain following, going up and down over hills, um, I can easily see situations where there's a eight kilometer radius of curvature in the vertical. If you go down, all of a sudden you're pulling negative one G, your, your train comes off the track. Um, what do you do then? So these systems are going to have to have very level um, uh, 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 guideways as well. So this, this part is crucial. If you have a Hyperloop um, uh, system, you know, one way you can increase your revenues is to have more stops. But as you add stops, you got to accelerate, slow down, stop, pick up passengers all the way through. I haven't seen any good ways to do this where you have a main full speed trunk line and then you have offline stations. Um, this requires um, uh, high speed switches. Uh, I believe the Japanese do this with Shinkansen. They have a, a pass through that goes at five, full speed and you have offline stations. This is absolutely critical for maintaining through, throughput and it should be designed into Hyperloop um, uh, for sure. And then, um, as I mentioned, it's really hard to make money with passengers. Um, let's just do the back of the envelope for San Francisco to Los Angeles. 40 passengers per pod, headway of three minutes, one-way ticket price of $100 you have a capacity factor of 80%, which is generous because people don't really go at 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, 
that means you're going to be moving 11 million passengers through this link. That's, uh, you, you think, well, the market can absorb that, but that's actually twice the number of airline passenger uh, between San Francisco and Los Angeles. Say it costs 20, 25 billion to build this link. Um, some people say it's going to cost less. It's not going to cost less. Um, uh, you know, California high-speed rail started out at like they were going to say 30 billion. Now it's 66 billion. It's going to be 100 billion before they they're done with it. Um, Hyperloop, you know, has a smaller footprint and has some advantages, but I think that vacuum system is going to be pretty expensive. Add to that the operations and maintenance of uh, what happens in 10 years after you've built your Hyperloop infrastructure and now you have to start replacing all those vacuum seals and all those things. It's, I think there's going to be a high maintenance expense. So 50-year uh, um, uh, amortization period, 6% interest. You're paying $1.5 billion a year in, uh, to pay it off. Um, this means for passenger only, you, you're losing uh, $1 billion per year. Um, on, on the Hyperloop system. Now, losing money on uh, passenger-only tra trans transport infrastructure uh, is not necessarily the end of the world. I think government should support um, uh, uh, infrastructure like that, especially if it's greener, um, safer, and more, you know, makes faster, all the other things that Hyperloop can be. But we are in a, in a position where um, governments are, are really constrained in what they can support. So, you need to maximize throughput and figure out new sources of revenue. <coughs> and of course, the biggest challenge of all is Hyperloop's uh, vacuum tube. Um, it's above ground. It's hundreds or thousands of kilometers long. As I said, temperature swings, failure points. What is the pumping power to maintain this vacuum? Um, I have not seen any good analysis of this. Um, and if the pumping power is higher than the drag power of running vehicles through the air, um, that you know, makes it questionable. Um, most importantly, it's an easy target. You have this elevated thing going through towns and thousands of streets passing underneath it. Just park a truck under it, blow up a tube, and then after a month when they fix it, go do the same thing again. You, know, you can shut down uh, the entire network uh, it's asymmetrical uh, warfare, so to speak. So I think what has to happen, well, let me just summarize the lessons learned. Go straight, avoid lateral le accelerations, um, run longer train sets when you, when you can with more passengers to, to increase revenues. Go faster. It will require a higher vacuum, but it gets your throughput much higher as well. And, there's, and people, uh, if they're going above Mach 1, um, that's something really revolutionary uh, and it allows uh, really interesting applications to open up. Maximize your returns um, by having offline stations and, and uh, fast switches. Choose higher fare routes if you can. Minimize build costs, all these things are obvious. Protect your tubes. Avoid seismic zones. If, uh, I'm not sure how they're going to get around that, um, but we have a talk today, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, minimize your failure points. I think uh, Hyperloop really needs to go subsurface. And the two options there are going underground. And that's the smartest thing Elon Musk has said so far about uh, Hyperloop. Going from DC to, to, to New York completely underground makes it, uh, in my mind, a much more viable system. Or go transoceanic, like Jules Verne suggested back in the 1800s. So, um, so I am, uh, uh, I am really rooting for uh, um, Hyperloop, and I, I look forward to where we can really push the envelope on the vacuum systems and go faster. I think that will make um, a better system overall. Um, I do have somewhat of a secret hidden agenda uh, for that, because if we can have really high vacuums, in Hyperloop, then we can uh, build star trams and go into space, um, which is my, uh, my, my dream because I want to have my own personal st space station in orbit, and this is how we do it. But um, <coughs> So you, uh, you have to have um, 
10 to the minus 2 uh, pascals to, to run a, a star tram. And so anything that helps us get there is, is, is good. <laughs> so with that, I, I say thank you very much. Um, and uh, glad to take any questions. Sure. Yeah. Was how 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 long was that? <laughs> okay. All right. Oh yeah. No. Sure. Uh, go ahead. Uh, what for Star Trek? What would the exit velocity? So orbital velocity is is uh, eight kilometers a second. Um, so you want to go eight or nine kilometers a second, um, uh, and then you have. There's circularizing orbits and things like that, but but uh, you want to go that fast. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So the the question was, what is the um, uh, what is the exit velocity for Star Tram applications? Uh, the value of adding maglev inside the tube for Hyperloop um, is it's the most robust levitation system. Uh, it's, well, uh, it's well understood. Uh, there's working examples. Um, it's very low energy. Um, unlike other levitation systems like uh, air, air cushions, air bearings, uh, you can get much higher <laughs> levitation gaps. Oh, I see. So the question was actually, what is the advantage of putting maglev in a tube versus maglev in the atmosphere? Yes. So at 300 miles an hour, um, you have significant air drag. Um, and air drag, uh, your, your, your power to overcome air drag goes up as the cube of your velocity. Um, so there comes a point where you really you can go faster if you pour, pump more energy into it, but it's just not economical. So 300 miles an hour, 350 is kind of like the top of you're going to go in the atmosphere. Um, and uh, like I said, like these transoceanic applications, uh, it would be much preferable to go in a tube. I haven't seen... I haven't seen the numbers on how much pumping power is required, so I can't really answer that question. Question there. Uh, yeah, so I saw your comparison between all the different MacLab systems. Yeah. I was wondering, uh, Transit P was built quite some time ago. Right. Now, nowadays, you have an Iodinium magnets. Mm -hmm. If you would create a base field yeah. uh, using superconductors or Iodinium magnets, would that work? Well, so Transrapid uses um, attractive electromagnet system. So they are turning off and on their magnets, um, uh, I think, you know, tens or hundreds of times a second to pull up the whole vehicle towards the guideway. With uh, permanent magnets, uh, you can't do that. You can't. If you make a combination, oh, I see. So, um, uh, I, sorry, the question was, could Transrapid be re-engineered with today's neodymium magnets uh, to make it more efficient um, and get a greater levitation gap? Yeah, sure. If you if you uh, if you um, put a hallback array on top of that, but then why not just do the complete hallback array and not have the electromagnetic in the first place? Professor, you mentioned that the pro uh, passenger only scheme is not profitable, but the Hokkaido and the other Shinkansen. Right. Well, I think Japan is one of the great places for passenger rail in in the world, um, with the high population densities and the commitment of the uh, of the government to really building out that system. Um, I don't see that happening here in the United States. Also, um, I have heard that the real money in Japan Rail comes from the real estate investments they make around the infrastructure, not from the passenger fares themselves. But um, uh, I'm sh I'd love to talk to the, talk to you more about that. Uh, in the back. You mentioned the, solving the hyperloop um, tracks for the system in the seismic zones, like California. Um, so how do you solve that, either underground or if you're above them? 
Yeah, I, I don't know. We have the next talk. I think it's going to uh, touch on that. So, um, Yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't looked at that. So the question was, uh, what about the Denver uh, route from the airport to Vail um, and going at high speeds, uh, radius of curvature with that? Um, yeah, I haven't looked at that route, but uh, it's definitely um, something they're going to have to work into their design for sure. Right. So they were going to build uh, uh, right up in uh, downtown DC to Fellowship or mm -hmm. going down the freeway. Right. Typically where they go when they're not in, in the city and talk on the freeway. But they wanted to take them in tour uh, from the freeway to Titan Corner. Yeah. And they were trying to they were going to build a tunnel. But it was too expensive, so they built it above ground. Yeah. So it was very expensive to go into. Yes. And the question, I guess that's the whole thesis of, so the question is, tunneling is very expensive. How can you afford to go underground? Um, and uh, I guess that's the whole thesis of the, the boring company. And Elon Musk says he can radically reduce the cost of, um, of, of tunneling. Um, I don't know for sure whether he's correct or not. Um, if, it's, if he's right, I think that's fantastic. Um, uh, but the cost of building at the surface is also getting really, really expensive. So at some point, it's just going to be cheaper to build underground, I think. Uh, oh, go ahead. Well, time is up. Um, maybe, is there anything to be answered in the question? Well, I was just thinking uh, a few Ron's comments yesterday and in light of your comments. Um, number one, he said that it's optimistic going forward uh, without taxpayer government subsidies. Right. It's going to have to be a private sector, number one. Yeah. Number two, he also uh, was pretty clear that maglev is too expensive. Right. So I was wondering if you could react to those two. Sure. The question is, uh, react to uh, Pete Ron's comments about uh, Hyperloop in the D.C. area, and um, he th thinks it will be affordable and profitable um, compared to maglev, which will be very expensive. Now, um, there's uh, not a lot of comparison the Japanese maglev system is expensive. Um, I've seen uh, um, two hundred million dollars a mile, but that is for the the route going from Tokyo to Nagoya, which is eighty percent through the Alps, very deep tunnels, um, and so it's not a very apples to apples comparison. Also, the, J the Japanese system is a first generation design, which has a U shaped guideway, expensive to build. It doesn't have to be that expensive. Maglev in principle, can be cheaper than rail. Um, Hyperloop, uh, I just, <laughs> I don't know how, he, how it's possible to, to um, I'm sure there's lots of rosy figures being thrown at him right now, but there's so many engineering challenges, it's way too early to really to make that assessment. Thank you. Oh, thank you.